Hello Fear Folks and welcome in Feardemic's apartment. My name is Lucas and that's enough about me. Let's get to my today's guest and here he is, very talented, very friendly and very handsome, <laughs> Kelvin Moore from Sumo Nottingham, the studio responsible for the upcoming game called, and I'm super happy to say it out loud, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hi Kelvin, how are you? I'm great, thanks for having me, it's great to be here. And I'm also super excited to speak with you. We will discuss about Texas Chainsaw Massacre and generally about, you know, facing the well-known brand and working on that. But before, before that, a little question just to warm up. How did you join the game industry? Uh, what were your first steps? Cool. So I've been in the industry, I think it's about 18 years now. I started my love of games kind of way back when I was a kid. So I remember my first memories of video gaming, Turtles on the NES around my uncle's house and getting my first kind of a, the Atari 7800, then mm -hmm. the Sega Mega Drive, and then kind of the golden era of gaming for me was the kind of the N64 era, mm -hmm. when things start to move into 3D. Um, and that's when I looked at kind of game dev as a kind of, people are actually making these games. And where I come from in, in Derby, mm -hmm. was, a, was a great hub for game development. We had, we had Euricom, we had Core Design. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Um, we also had Rare, we're just around the corner at Twycross. So all these great games being made in and around the city I lived in, hearing all these wonderful tales and stuff. So that's what I want to do. I went to university, did a small kind of computing um, degree course. Mm -hmm. um, but what really got me in there was um, there was a flyer in a local independent game store. And it's like, do you want to get paid to play games? And it's like, of course I do. And back then, kind of QA was seen as the way you go QA into design. It's like, this is, this is the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of Took that flyer, I rang, I rang them up, and it was. It turns out it was actually for Rare, um, and amazingly, it was QA on their launch titles for the Xbox 360. So oh, yeah. Cameo and Perfect Dot Zero. So, as a massive fan of their games and kind of those titles and IPs, it was great to kind of have that first step in with those guys. And from there, I kind of moved to Eurocom, did QA there, and got design opportunities. Yeah, and if, the, the rest is history. I'm now at Sumo Digital after kind of yeah nearly 18 years. So it sounds like you were in the perfect place yeah. for you. The great yeah. environment to start working in the game dev industry. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a great time. I'm really fortunate to kind of get into the industry when I did. I know, you know there's a lot of competition now more so than, than mm -hmm. ever before. A lot of great talent and people competing for for the roles and stuff. But yeah, very fortunate to, to get in. So from QA to to the legend, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes. It's like, how did it happen that you are working on this project? How was, what were the beginnings of it? So we were approached by Gun Media, mm -hmm. who kind of previously worked on uh, Layers of Fear 2 and the Friday the 13th horror title. Um, they handled that kind of IP so well that they were approached to do kind of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to kind of increase kind of the, the quality and fidelity of the game and kind of have more of a kind of AAA production values onto it. So they kind of approached us to kind of work on the project three years ago now, mm. um, just before lockdown. Um, so we oh, kind yeah, of, the three years? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, just yeah, just gone. So we they came over early March. Uh, it was Ronnie and Robin-ish. Mm -hmm. They came over, we kind of talked about the GDD and everything and kind of what their vision was and kind of how we're going to work together and bring this to life. They flew back and yeah, then we went into lockdown. <laughs> so <laughs> making it Perfect remotely timing, was, yeah. a, was a right challenge and stuff, but it's been, it's been great working with those guys. Um, and yeah, it's, um, it's a great IP to be working on. So you're working on it already three years. That's, uh, yeah. that's a long. It's, yeah. a, it's a very long time. Games, you know, they can take a lot longer, so it can be a lot shorter as well, mm -hmm. but we've been fortunate enough to be given the time to get this into the, the best possible shape that it, mm -hmm. that it could be. You only get one chance at kind of making that first impression. That's true, yeah. that's true. Uh, I was preparing to this conversation and last uh, night I watched, I did the rewatch of the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I was sitting to 1 a.m., so sorry if I'm a little bit sleepy. <laughs> and it still holds up. It's, it's still a great movie. It is legendary for many horror fans. Yes. It's almost saintly, so I guess it is a little bit stressful for you that, um, how do you approach the source material? How do you find the balance between, I don't know, making maybe a homage to this movie, but also adding something fresh uh, from you? So when we kind of first started out, kind of looking at the vision, the direction of the title, I worked very closely with kind of our exec producer mm -hmm. in, in Sumer Nottingham, looking at kind of 
what what our vision for this game is. And one of those kind of vision statements was kind of distinctly Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but also a modern 2023 experience. And what do we bring into that and kind of do with it? So you've got the the qualitative production values, you've got the graphics and stuff like that. But also what is what is Texas Chainsaw itself? Mm-hmm. The, the fear, the tension, the kind of that traditional horror of, you know, you have this this family who are, you know, what they do is wrong, but they're just trying to survive themselves in their own way of life. And bringing those kind of themes across into the character design and everything. Um, Ronnie Hobbs over at Gun Media is a massive fan of the original film, and this is really his his kind of baby. And the the chats we have together of kind of kind of creating these characters, their abilities, their backstories, mm-hmm. kind of. The, the amount of detail that, that we go into together is, has been fantastic. So you're not going to make uh, another uh, general uh, combat multiplayer. You really are into these characters. They're not uh, faceless. You, you can Correct. see they have their character and you can follow the story in the game. Exactly. I mean, the victims, we call them victims, not survivors. <laughs> They're very much victims. Okay. They all have their own kind of backstories, which goes into the kind of traits that they have as a playable character, where they come from, what their ability might be. Um, and again, the abilities are all grounded. We're not kind of supernatural or anything. They're all kind of believable um, mm-hmm. and help kind of add meat to the bones of those characters. I have one e- extra question because now it just came to me. Uh, why exactly multiplayer? game? So that's a really good question. And there's some people, even within our team, are like, it'd be great to do a single player experience mm-hmm. of this. But that's that's not what Gun do and that's not we you know what what we want to do either. Multiplayer is such a, a massive thing and the great thing about having it as a multiplayer experience is the, the extensive replayability. The team has gone to great lengths to create these kind of these scenarios that come through natural gameplay, these humanistic behaviors mm-hmm. against playing, you're not playing against Leatherface, who's an AI with kind of, oh, he's looking this way. It's like, that's another human there. And they're kind of, they're doing all these humanistic behaviors that you would play in a natural game of hide and seek, let's mm-hmm. say. And that makes it infinite replayable. And it's like, that's a lot more exciting than kind of a one shot single player game for us. And maybe even more scary uh, when you think about it. Like, Absolutely. Like you said, it's a human being uh, behind yeah. the leather face. Yeah, there's there's a whole concept of hiding in plain sight. Mm-hmm. And you just it's amazing what you can get away with if you just hide in a bush and hold your nerve. It's, it's amazing to experience and see and, When we have people play test in the game, mm-hmm. you know, they start off and someone's coming towards them and they'll, they'll leg it and run away. And they slowly learn, it's like, hang on, I, I can get away with it. And they're there like mm-hmm. this tense and we've got people watching them all around the kind of the monitors. And it's like, has he seen them? And then they kind of walk up, it's like, how did you get away with that? And it's like, that's a testament to kind of all the, the technical details we've put into the lighting systems as well. That, mm-hmm. you know, that's something that's really important to the game is making sure that It's balanced enough that you get those light and dark areas, but also you're not making it too dark to play. Um, so there's a lot of time spent on, on getting that lighting just right. Oh, sounds amazing. But by the way, this is not your first time working with a, a well-known brand, because if I checked it correctly, of course, you were working on Disney Infinity series in the past. That's right, yeah. And of course, I imagine that you cannot tell me too much because this is Disney, but if you just can say anything about how difficult or how easy uh, was working with such a recognizable brand? It's always, I mean, I've worked with IP since my first design job. So that mm-hmm. was Disney um, GeForce, which was a guinea pig movie. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> way back when that was my first design role. After that, we did Disney Universe, which was another IP matchup with Disney. And then yes, when I moved to Ninja Theory, I worked on Disney Infinity, and that was in particular the Star Wars brand. And mm. It's always great to be entrusted with someone else's baby, essentially, and doing kind of doing them justice and really getting in there and understanding why things are the way they are. Star Wars is such a massive brand. Okay. There's so much lore out there, canon, non-canon, and you know, rightly so, they protect it really, really well. They have people within their studio are experts on everything. It's a fantastic opportunity. It's always great working with them. Is it difficult? Difficult probably isn't the word that I would use. Mm-hmm. It's if you have the right level of understanding of what you know what their pillars are of their brand um, and respect them and their opinions, it's great. Um, the surprising things working with IP with Disney is 
is who has what kind of, um, who owns certain things. Okay. Um, we wanted to use certain characters in Disney Universe, for example, but it's like Disney, it's like, yeah, they're Disney characters, but they're not necessarily ours to kind of really? sign away and put in there. Yeah, so it's great hearing these little little secrets behind about mm -hmm. kind of the kind of politics behind different characters and different setups and stuff. So it's like uh, uh, we want to use this Disney character, and they were all like, "Yeah, but uh, there is a, that guy somewhere. He has rights. We need to speak to him yeah, first." Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. And it, you know, even even as far as not even main characters, but mm -hmm. kind of. We have ideas for mechanics in games. It's like, we'd like to use this kind of feature of the film as a mechanic in here. It's like, you can't exactly use that directly because that's owned by someone else and stuff. Oh, it's, really? There's a whole world of world of stuff out there. And there's got many great stories, but probably not for public consumption. Okay. <laughs> so it is kind of difficult that uh, on one hand you have characters that are already established and well known, but you cannot do everything with them what you want. Exactly. Yes, yes. Okay. So you, you said that from almost from the beginning you were working on outsourced IPs. Yep. I don't know if it's a good question to you, but in your opinion, what's more difficult? Struggling with a well-known uh, character and franchise or creating something completely new? Or I guess the answer can be depends. <laughs> I, I mean, you're absolutely right. The answer does kind of depend. And it depends who has control of that kind mm -hmm. of new IP as well. Um, is it yourself? Are you kind of you the protector and the kind of the guardian of this new IP. Um, you've got to answer all these questions and think of all the backstories and take mm -hmm. everyone on that journey with you. With an established IP, that's usually all there for you. And it gives you a bit of a head start, but there's also the constraints. Like mm -hmm. you, you can't have this character doing X or this character doing Y because that's not in their nature, that's not in their backstory, it's not part of their law. Part of those restrictions is also where creativity is pushed. We have an idea for an ability and it's like, that suits the gameplay. That's, that's really the experience you want to get out. How do we ground this and make it believable for that character and this IP? Um, and those are the real challenges and that's where kind of some of the best creativity comes from. So on one hand you have a, a lot of limitations sometimes, but they kind of, you can say even help? You yeah. with, with this creativity because you need to, I don't know if it's the right expression, uh, jump over the obstacle? Yeah, that's maybe that expression. I don't know. I might have ruined that question for you. <laughs> you <can laughs> no, no, no. It's, 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 it's completely yeah. fine. And just, um, just, you know, trying to find out how, like, well, like you said, uh, we said, uh, depends on, on the project. So yeah. how it looks like with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's uh, you often have the situation when you have some idea for a character or the mechanic or the, or, or the setting or whatever, and you hear something like, no, nah, you can do it because uh, it doesn't suit the, our vision of, uh, of the well-established brand. Yes, there's, there's the brand side of things and the fact that it's a very realistic game. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of supernatural entity in there or, or things like that. It's, it's horror, it's very real. So the things we have to get away with, um, obviously we, we need mechanics to be kind of accessible players and understandable. So sometimes you have to push on those rules a little bit, but you've always got in the back of your mind kind of, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. is, is this believable in this scenario? Um, and it's, it's striking that balance um, and make sure you don't go too far the other way and you, you break the immersion, especially mm -hmm. for a horror game. So you cannot make Leatherface shooting with lasers from his eye because exactly. that wouldn't, exactly. wouldn't work. Okay, I understand. Yeah. You said that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is very re realistic and that's true. When I was watching the, the movie last night, I was surprised. I, I remember that movie differently because uh, I saw it's very how to say it, maybe not scary, but disturbing. It's very disturbing yes. because it's real. And we saw the trailer of your, of your game, looks amazing. And we see that it's going to be very violent and realistic in this violence. So are you going full steam ahead with it, guts and blood, or maybe you'll try to be more restrained? We, we, we've got to stay true to the original source material. Mm -hmm. So you watch the movie, there's very little, you know, even though this guy's going around with a chainsaw, there's not blood spraying everywhere and, and so on yes. and so forth. And that's partly down to kind of their restrictions with budgets back in the day and stuff like that. We could have easily taken that and just gone, no, we're going to guts everywhere flying and stuff. But it's like, <laughs> no, we, we want to remain true. So our gore level has increased. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's great videos and trailers out already that show kind of there's, there's blood flying around. There's kind of nasty cuts and everything. And it's really quite visceral. But we're still not going kind of full on gore and entrails mm -hmm. and stuff because that's not the uh, that's not the IP and that's not the brand. So we're trying to remain faithful. Mm -hmm. 
I have w one more uh, extra question. Let's imagine that you can work on any IP in the world. You can. What game w would you do? Um, my biggest love, my dream is is the Jurassic Park IP. Oh, I didn't expect so, that answer. Why? Yeah, it's just as a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. you know, dinosaurs were a magic thing back then, and that movie was kind of. No, so fantastic. I love watching it, love the IP, love the world mm -hmm. and stuff. So having a chance to work on a project with dinosaurs in it is, is kind of that's still my, my dream thing. I can't um, even imagine it, like you're doing similar to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the multiplayer game where players are characters and some are dinosaurs. Yeah, mm, yeah. That would work. That yeah. would be amazing. So in, in just a few words, wrapping up the Texas Chainsaw Massacre subject, if you can say for who this game is, what, who's the target? Of it, who should play the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Of course, fans of the movie as yep. well, but besides of them, so fans of multiplayer games, mm -hmm. absolutely. Fans of the the kind of horror genre, and particularly you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there for for new players to come in and try multiplayer survival horror. We've you know, this isn't hardcore kind of high entry to, to okay. get in there. We have. Or focus test. We have people in the studio who are not traditional gamers. They come in. If, if you can hold a controller, you can experience the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and that fear and kind of adrenaline rush. So it's, it's a game that's got something for kind of so many different types of players. But predominantly, it's, it's, it's multiplayer horror. Mm. Um, and I think everyone who plays those sorts of games are going to love this. I cannot wait to try it because I'm a huge fan of horror games, horror yep. movies, and I like to be scared. But when I'm, I'm listening about your title, it's like, I want to be the face. This time I want to scare all the yeah. people, so can't wait to play it. And yeah, the project sounds amazing. Thank you. I have a question at the end to you that I really want to ask to every guest here in Freedom apartment. It's a very strange question. Let's imagine that you are on deserted island, mm -hmm. but you can take free games with you. And of course, let's assume that you have electricity and consoles to play it, et cetera, et cetera. What games would you choose? Wow, wow, the, the dreaded question. But three games is very generous. Um, <laughs> one game for me, you know, it's it's really casual and it's very popular, mm -hmm. Fortnite. Oh. I, I really enjoy that as a, as a greatly instantly accessible game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I play a lot with, with my kids on Fortnite and kind of family on Fortnite, so I, I I think it's a, it's a superb game um, and the, the way it's ever revolving and stuff is fantastic. So that'd definitely be one thing that's on there. I also really like strategy games as well, kind mm -hmm. of top-down strategy games So in city building. So City Skylines, that's a, that's that's a great game, game that you can just get lost in and I spend forever. I lost so many hours in City Skylines, it's like I will never <laughs> retrieve it. Exactly, <laughs> it's exactly. It's like before you know it's 2 a.m. and it's like... <laughs> still keep going it's it's amazing so yeah that'd be great and then i've got a bit of retro arcadey kind mm -hmm. of fun so there was a game way back when on the mega drive called wiz and liz it was made by um Psygnosis, and i still play that to this day it's just super fast side scrolling platformer and it's, it's insane and i urge everyone to have a look at that and have a dabble it's super good fun it's amazing uh, when I uh, I really like ask this question uh, to everybody because you can r really see the range of uh, other people talking about it because you are the guy who is working on uh, the horror <laughs> game, yeah. but you're like Fortnite strategy game and retro game. This is amazing and this yeah. is very cool. Yeah, it's. I mean, there are other games that are you, know, you really enjoy. Bioshock's been a great game that I loved oh, yeah. from way back when. Um, it's a great game. Stand on the desert island, complete it. Kind of these other ones would be definitely the time and time again, replayability is fantastic. Uh, Calvin, that there are all questions I had to you. Uh, it was great to speak with you about the both the Chainsaw Massacre and, you know, brands in general. At the end, uh, let me ask you uh, when we can expect to finally become Leatherface. So the massacre is going to be unleashed in August this year. It's available day one on Xbox Game Pass mm -hmm. and it will also be on Steam, PlayStation consoles and the current Xbox consoles as well. Okay, that sounds amazing. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks Once for having again, me. Please uh, visit us in Freedom Mix Apartment uh, again with other amazing guests we have for you.